Hi, everybody. Welcome to another um, exciting lecture from Architecture is Free. Today we have uh, Oti Yankiera, and uh, we're very excited to have her today. She's uh, coming to us from Ghana. She's been an instructor with Architecture is Free actually for about since March, I think, of last year. And she also leads up one of our research groups on a sustainable design in Ghana. And she's been putting the research together and it's quite interesting because it's prime, a lot of it's primary research. She literally has been taking buses places and like snapping pictures out of the window of buses or walking around in little villages and talking to local people. So it's really interesting that way because a lot of the stuff that we usually learn about sustainable practices in places like Ghana, it's really like at arm's length. It's not from people who are actually there. So this is going to be a really nice opportunity uh, to do that. So OT has, a, I believe, um, an architecture degree from Central University in Ghana. And she works as an architect. She practices as an architect. And she's very um, busy doing that, as well as working on her research. So OT, it's such a pleasure to have you. Um, also, I know that OT's been uh, thinking about applying to schools in the United States. Um, so if anybody you know, has any uh, information that could be helpful for OT in that process, we'd appreciate it. Anyway, OT, I'll hand it over to you and welcome and welcome everybody. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for having me and thank you to our faculty members and everyone for making time to be at today's presentation. So I will just delve right into it. Okay, so I hope everyone can hear me properly. So in architecture school, in architecture school, we were taught, and I would paraphrase, that architecture addresses the present, it took into consideration the past, and anticipated the future. But clearly that is not what is happening in our day to day. Our buildings are so westernized, they create discomfort instead of comfort. Our industry, funny enough, sits at number three and six of pollution contributors, with construction at number three and the production of materials at number six. And who knows where we would be on the scale if all other, if the production of other devices that made our spaces, air quotes, sustainable were included. So today I'll be talking to you about some sustainable building practices in Ghana that could be employed in Ghana's architecture today. So to guide the presentation, I'll be sharing with you my aim and my goal or what I seek to achieve with this research, the location of my research and also my research approach. So the aim of this research is to um, basically identify the traditional construction methods that are already in existence. And um, Ghana being a very culturally diverse place, every tribe, every clan, every ethnic group have a way in which they do everything, including their construction. Also, to my discovery, every place or every climatic zone in Ghana has a material that could be used for construction, which costs close to nothing. But here's a case we do not know about. So this research seeks to identify those and also to develop, um, to, to develop modern versions of these um, traditional buildings that we already have in, in existence. There's a, a group of architects, a group of people like me that want to bring these local architecture into today's, I mean, introduce it to people of today or in quotes, our modern day people, but they do not buy the idea because of how unpleasing it looks so this research would seek to come up with very modern, aesthetically pleasing, but functional buildings that suits uh, modern day Ghanaian. So at the end of this research, I would be happy to see that we have in some way preserved the building um, methods that are already in existence, the materials that are already um, on ground that is being used by the locals, that's, that's knowledge, that wisdom is being preserved 
for generations yet to come. And also to try and prevent the control, the control of concrete buildings that is spreading in the North. This research, um, this presentation or this research is going to be a template for future researches that I'll be, I'll be conducting around Ghana, but I'm beginning with Northern Ghana at the moment. And it would be my, my um, greatest achievement to see that the spread of concrete in that area is reduced or even maybe not happening at all. So why did I choose to do this in the first place? Um, there has been so many stories linked to me trying to do this research, but the one that I would like to talk about today is my obsession for natural building materials back in school. But I used to use them as a cladding just for aesthetics, just for the beauty of it. I wasn't using it, should I say, functionally. But as I um, got to my final year, I came to learn that these materials that I was using as cladding could actually form part of the building. And then I discovered ramp earth and I discovered um, compressed stabilized earth blocks. And I was like, oh, this will be nice to do here. But then again, I thought about it. I didn't want to just copy what I was seeing on the internet or was seeing in books over here. There should be a way to merge what has already been done on the ground and what I was seeing. And so that pushed me to begin this research to find out how people in Northern Ghana were building with these, uh, with earth as a material, because they looked so much like rammed earth buildings. And I was, I was curious basically. So let's just say curiosity <laughs> brought me here. And there's been so many times I wanted to stop because Finding information on these things is very hard. You have to go to the places yourself. And it's not just physically exhausting, financially, it was exhausting as well. But what has kept me going is that last year, when I took my trip to the north of Ghana with five other friends, we slept over at a hotel in Bogatanga, which is in the um, Upper East region. And after, I had days work walking around and feeling very hot because it's a 40 degrees Celsius over there and it can get as hot as 45 degrees Celsius. It was very hot. At the end of the day, I just wanted to get to my the hotel room, take a cold shower to cool me down before I went to bed. But to my surprise and displeasure, the water that was running from the tap was hot. It was hot as if a heater was connected. And before I was about to take my shower, I took my towel from the hotel room and hung it on the rack in the bathroom to go and change myself and, you know, get into the shower. And by the time I came back, my towel was as hot as it had been freshly ironed because of the contact it had with the wall. That is how hot the walls and the space was. It was unbearable to stay in unless you were using an air condition. And then I thought about the what of the average what of the average um, person who could not afford um, air conditioning? How are they going to live in this space? And mind you, these concrete buildings would make the temperature on the interior 10 times hotter or higher. So if it was about a 30 degree Celsius out, you are having 40 degrees Celsius in. Whereas if you were using F, you would have 10, degree, 10 degrees Celsius lower of a temperature. So if it was at 30 degrees outside, you would have 20 degrees on the inside, which would be cool and comfortable to live in. But after interacting with the people in the area, I could understand why they would opt for that because their buildings had to be maintained or in some cases rebuilt every year because of the heavy rains. And it was becoming tiring for them. So they decided to go with these concrete buildings and masonry wall buildings because those lasted longer. So although I was angry at them doing that, somehow I could understand. And they agreed that if they knew better, they would have done better. And this is what encourages me and motivates me to do this research every day. So as I said earlier, from what I had learned, 
each climatic zone in Ghana had one material or let me say a predominant way that buildings were being constructed to suit the climate of that area. So in the Sudan savanna and also in the Guinea savanna, you see the heavy presence of earth as a building material. And that was because it was in abundance over there. And to gather the materials to construct, nobody would have to go even up to a kilometer, even up to a kilometer radius, even up to a kilometer radius. Then in the, in the transitional zone, which is not my concentration at the moment, I haven't as of yet, um, I haven't as of yet identified any, though there are some in existence. And then fortunately for me, because of work, I have had the opportunity to stay, to live in the tropical rainforest area for about four months. And just by driving through town and looking at how things are done, I saw the heavy presence of bamboo and to my surprise, raffia palm. Not in my wildest dreams would I have imagined raffia palm being used as a material for construction. And it was really interesting and beautiful how the locals used it. And in the future, I'll be presenting and my findings on that as well. So a little bit about the people in Northern Ghana. There are five regions that constitute the Northern um, region of Ghana, namely the Upper West region, the Upper East, the Northeast, the Savannah, and the Northern region. There are 54 districts in all and 26 major tribes. And like I said, the people there are culturally diverse. So there's a population of 6.7 million at the moment, as at the 2021 population census. Now, people in this area um, find us, themselves in four main occupation, with two being the major, the first being farming, and then we have animal rearing. And also, these farmers and animal um, rearers also double as um, porters, and also weavers. So the average income per month is 154 Ghana cities, which is about um, $9.1. And it's a very <laughs> small amount. So it still baffles my mind how they are able to afford um, bags of cement, which um, costs more over there. If it's being sold in the South for 40 Ghana cities, you would get a bag of cement in Northern Ghana for 50 Ghana cities. And if you are earning 154 Ghana cities, how are you really working it out to um, afford bags of cement to fabricate blocks and also to construct? So this raised a concern for me. So the population per household is six on the average, though it could be more. Most of the compound houses, they hold generations of families and it covers a land area of 71,702 square kilometers. And I'm not sure I have explored even up to 2,000 square kilometers, so I still have a lot of work to do. So I have tackled this research in three levels where I have named it the observation stage, the adaptation stage, and then the translation stage. In the observing stage, which I have, which I am currently on, conducting a reconnaissance study where I am just looking at these buildings, how it's being built, how it's coming together, how the materials are being used, trying to find information on racial mixes and just how they are doing their construction, basically from foundation to the roof level. And at the adaptation stage, I would be breaking down everything that I have observed and conducting experiments. For instance, in my bid to make these um, construction uh, methods modding, I would look at modding materials that I could, and that science has allowed us to have that will not cost much and actually can be found in the area. For instance, there's now the rise of mycelium. So should I mix mycelium with earth? What is going to happen to it? How is it going to be like? Currently, they use um, cow dunk as the uh, binding agent. So if I should use a certain ratio of cow dunk to a particular type of latrite, 
what's the outcome. So in the adaptation stage, I'll just be conducting experiments and doing series of tests to make sure this is feasible and that people can understand and take it to opportunity to be introduced to them. So at the translation stage, which is the final stage, I would put everything I have gathered together. At this stage, I'll come up with design solutions that are that can be easily built by the locals, can understand. At this point, to all the information gathered will be documented, preserved, and even maybe a museum or a place where people can just come, look at what has been done, can learn from, and can also you know, serve as a learning material for future generations to come. So at the observation stage where I am now, I explored it in five main themes. I examined or I looked at the form of the buildings I saw, the plan and its function, the construction of the, these buildings, the aesthetics, and then a few of the materials that is being used. So here is a building I a building I visited in Siribu, and it's a, a a rectangular building with very rounded corners. It almost looks like an oval from the plan view. At this point, I was too scared to climb the ladder to stand on the roof and take as as much pictures as I wanted to, but I wish I did that now. <laughs> so aside this rectangular with rounded um, edges. They also have the typical round um, buildings. With this particular town, I then the name is so I don't know how to describe it. I just can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, so we have the rounded um, buildings as well, and then we have the um, very rectangular or square ones that had quite some sharp corners and. Um, this is a, a, a lobby house documented by um, Hannah Schreckenberg in her book, Construction Technology for a Tropical Developing Country. And this book has been a great resource for me at this um, stage of my research. So now the plan and the function, the interesting thing about the people in the North is they didn't just build for humans, they, they built for humans, they built for their animals and they also built for their gods. In the typical um, compound house in the north, there's always one entrance and one exit. Another entrance and exit, there is the god or the deity housed to protect the occupants of the compound. They would also have um, the, should I say houses, <laughs> for their chickens and their goats along the walls, the exterior walls of the compound. And then you have the typical sleeping area, kitchen, and then an open courtyard where all sorts of activities took place, including storytelling and um, family um, celebrations. So I'm quick, I'll quickly take you through the construction. And from here, I'll begin with the foundation. I was surprised to find out that not all buildings there started with foundations as I was taught in architecture school. So over here, there were three main ways in which foundation was being done. So the first, which is A we have over here, is a mixture of just boulders, stone, and um, mud rolled into balls that is compacted into the ground. The second, um, option you could go in for depending on where you were building is a not too shallow ground and it didn't have stones just um, balls of mud compacted into place and the final one which i find the most intriguing you just clear the area you want to build wet the floor and it's ready to receive your to receive the shell of your building but the the walls are beautifully constructed with these um, mud rolled into balls and pressed into place. And when it came to construction in the North, it was a community affair. Everybody was involved. Mothers, fathers, kids, everyone was involved. And after you have your walls, you would want um, an entrance. And over here, entrances were done in two ways. The wall was um, finished completely. And then a cutlass were sharp to used to create the opening for the 
the door. It could either be an oblong shape, it could be a, a circle, or in very rare instances, a rectangle. And on the right image over here, you have the, um, the door frame being put in place and then the wall constructed around it. So these are just pictures of um, houses with different um, door openings available. And with the last picture on my right, which I took in Sirigu, there is an interesting story as to how there is some sort of a short wall um, right behind the door opening. So in, the, in that area, it was popular for slave raiders to come in, kidnap people and sell them out for slavery. And um, how the slave masters used to come and attack them at some point was they would use, um, they would just light, since they wouldn't come out from their huts to be, um, to be captured, they would light a fire and put it into their room, not knowing that they had vents at the top of their rooms to help the heat to escape. And so they wouldn't come out and they'll lie down quietly. But what this short wall served was a protection for them to use spears, spears to um, pierce the foot of these slave raiders to scare them off so that they were safe. So typically in a house in the north, you wouldn't have windows. Very rare instances do they have windows. There would always be an opening between the wall and the roof where your warm air would rise and escape through. It was either on top of the door of the entrance or the opposite side of the entrance. In some cases, they would have vents at the top. That is for the buildings that had flat roofs, which I will talk about later. They would have vents at the top where the heat could just escape through. So there were two main ways in which they made roofs in the north. They had the conical roof, which is a bit common, and then they had the flat roof. And with the conical roofs, it was um, constructed by putting four um, rafters in place and tying them with a canal fiber, which acted as a rope. And when all when the four have been put in place and is you know strong enough, they would they would add on with smaller, um, smaller um, rafters to fill in the gaps. And then they would tie their pellings. And it was amazing for me to find out that their pellings wasn't even wood. It, I mean, in few instances, they would use um, branches of a, a young neem tree, or they would just take grass until they have achieved the thickness in which they want. And then they will bind it all together with the canal fiber and I use the same canal fiber to tie the rafters, to tie the pellings onto the rafters. Now with a with a flat roof, this was a picture I took in the house at Sirigu from the inside, just to get an idea of how the rafters and the pellings were being, uh, were being um, arranged. And it was interesting for me to find out that the flat roof served so many purposes other than just um, other than just being a roof. So in the north, because they lived with their animals, you dare not dry your, your produce on the ground. By the time you come back, your chickens and your birds have eaten it all up. So the flat roof became um, a place in which they dried a lot of their food because it was way out of the reach of the animals in the house. It also served as a place for um, a place in which they stood for announcements. Should, they, should anyone have identified that a slave raider was coming into the community, they would just stand there and shout to get everyone's attention. And in special ceremonies such as weddings and funerals, someone would just come and stand at the rooftop, which they would call a town crier, would just come and stand at the roof and shout and announce in the community of the wedding of so-and-so person or the funeral of so-and-so person. And also in the times where the weather was a bit um, cool at night, though it's very hot in the north, in the evenings, it's quite cold. So people would take their mats and lie at their rooftop and stargaze and relax, basically. So like I said, construction over there took the whole community, men, women, children. 
And in this instance, they left their finishing for their women to put their beautiful touch to it. So women were resp responsible for constructing their floors and also for beautifying the shell or the exterior of their building. So on my left, you see a picture of women using clubs to hit, um, to pound um, latrites in place. And because of the smooth finish they needed, they would make um, a, a runny mixture of earth with cow dung, and then they would use that to finish the floor, pounding it into place. And then on the exterior, you would have, after the wall has been constructed, they would use this same watery um, um, earth mixture with cow dung to fill in any defects in the walls before they used pebbles or flat stones to smoothing the wall like the Biosa woman is doing in the last picture. Now to my favorite part, the aesthetics. The thing about people in the North is when you are not from there and you look at how they beautify their buildings, you might think, oh, this is for decoration, but really every design has a purpose and a meaning. And this picture I'm looking at over here is um, a house in Mognori. And um, in, this particular, in, in this particular design, when we asked the tour guide what it was, he explained to us that the symbols that we see embossed on the walls is actually the calendar. But unfortunately, the wisdom or the knowledge in how to read this calendar wasn't passed down. And so now it just serves as plainly aesthetic, so beautifying the walls. But um, many, many years ago, it served as a calendar for their ancestors and forefathers. So um, also on my left here is another way in which the facade was being designed. In this particular design, they would use sharp tools or stones to um, emboss different partings onto these buildings. Later on, I'll explain the meanings of some of these partings. And in certain places too, which on the, on the right is, um, a house in the Dagomba compound, they use um, broken ceramic wares, broken ceramic um, wares em embedded on the coping or the frame of the building to, uh, to, to beautify the exterior. So like I said, they had a meaning for every symbol, every pattern in which they put on their buildings. And in the North, everything they did had a spiritual connotation. So every symbol signified either for protection or for the status in the, uh, the status of the occupants of their house or just manifesting good things um, to happen to their family. So on my left, you have a symbol of a a man and a woman, and it symbolizes love and unity. On my right, we have a cow, which symbolizes wealth. In the north, the more cows you had, the wealthier you were. And instead of paying money in certain um, tribes as bride price for women, in the north, the strength of the man going to marry a woman is determined by the number of cows in which they are able to present to the family. So on my left here is the calabash which symbolizes versatility. And on my right is the fish, which symbolizes a happy home. And you will notice from the previous slide that each, each symbol had the negative spaces filled in by patterns, and these patterns had meanings as well. So the zigzag symbolizes respect, the stripe symbolizes excitement, the dot symbolizes blessing, and then the wavy symbolizes the road to success. So here are a, a few tools and materials that is being used for um, finishing or the constructing of buildings in the north. We have the flat pebbles, which is being used to smoothing or to plaster the walls after the wall has been constructed. And then also they have the coins in which they used to draw or emboss some of the patterns into the wall. And then you notice that the patterns in which was used on the, the paintings that were used on the uh, buildings were done in three colors. And these um, colors were derived from the, the white, um, being derived from the white limestone. The red is derived from the red oxide stone. 
and then black from the black egg. And they all put in a little bit of cow dung to sort of um, reduce the wearing off of the um, paint once it's applied onto the building. And then the limestone is sometimes um, applied on the walls like a chalk. And also to my, um, one other shocking thing that I experienced when I went to Mugnori, I was being told that they derived wax from the share nuts. All I thought share, um, the share nuts produced was butter. I didn't know, butter and oil. I didn't know you could derive wax from it. So the people in Monori would use the wax of their building to seal the surface of their walls after construction, such that if water poured on it, it would run off easily. In certain areas where the African locust beans, or like we locally call it dawa dawa, is being grown, they would use the husk of the, they would sometimes, um, they would sometimes, um, so I say grind, yes, they'll grind the husk of the um, locust bean husk into a powder and mix it with the um, latrite mixture to bind it. And in certain areas, so they will boil the husk of the um, locust bean and pour it into the mixture to also bind it as well. So I would um, ask for your indulgence in this short video, basically explaining everything in so much details for all of us to see what I have spoken about today. And I hope you enjoy this video.
So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I'd like to end with um, Anna Haringer's quotes, less concrete, more earth. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Oti. That was like mesmerizing. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I really like the way you set up your research in the beginning too. Like it was very clear, like your objectives and like how you went about um, identifying the different areas of research. So I learned so much. I mean, it's like really interesting to see something that has been documented like firsthand, you know, as opposed to like, what we usually get through secondhand or thirdhand information. So for me, it was like, yeah, like uh, mesmerizing is the only word I can think of. So congratulations. I think you did a tremendous amount of work. And I understand how difficult it is because you're financing your own research. You know, you're having to travel places and do this. And we hope, um, or at least I hope that I can find a way to maybe work with you and through the, our platform to try to maybe get some uh, funding so that you can do more of this research. But I'm like really, really super impressed and like kind of in awe of what you're trying to do. So again, congratulations. I'd like to open it up to other Thank people you. for questions. Hi, Oti. Um, unfortunately, Hi. I I only caught maybe 20, 25 minutes uh, of it. So um, I'll, I'll save uh, the commentary, the full commentary until I've seen the recording. But um, I, I, what I saw was, was, was really wonderful. Um, excellent graphics. Uh, I, I, I logged in just before the part where you mentioned how the aesthetics always had a purpose. And uh, which, which is very, which is very true. We, we look at a number of forms and we think, oh wow, that looks really nice. But um, we're not realizing why it came about to be. And, and you touching on that, I, I thought was was really helpful. Um, you, you also um, discussed some of um, the, the the patterns and the meanings, uh, many of which I didn't know. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed. Um, I really enjoyed that. I, I thought your video was um, a nice conclusion as, as well. And I, Dan mentioned that you're financing all of this on, on your own, and I, I'm, I'm just really um, amazed at uh, how much you've been able to do by by yourself, considering the circumstances and and, and knowing how far you have to travel. Um, to, to read some of these places and, and, and to secure access to, to some of these places. So I, I think you're onto something that, that could be a remarkable piece of, of, of research and very valuable to, um, to many sources um, who are out there you know, looking at uh, ways to, to borrow from the past, and especially in this environment where we're all dealing with climate change and looking at yeah. how to be more resilient in, in, in using what's around us. So this, this could be something that's of value, not just to people in, in Africa, but, but in, in much of the global South and, and even in the West as, as well. So yeah. um, thank you for taking up this challenge and um, staying dedicated to it. I'm looking forward to, to seeing, like Daniel said, where some of us could be of assistance uh, and, and helping you push and uh, take it further. So congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things to think about would be um, how this translates into maybe other building typologies or scales, even if it's not like wholesale construction, maybe components, um, uh, how this might uh, translate into, it's maybe a loaded word, but like a contemporary version of the traditional, right? That kind of learns from the traditional, but has a different design aesthetic. And, you know, maybe at some point along in the research and maybe it's through the foundation, this gets tested either through like a summer studio or through 
um, kind of a design project similar to like what um, Christian and Amadou did in Livingston and others with the tropical house and such. And so I, I think you're still in sort of the investigation stage, but you yeah. know, keep your eye on where this could go too. So you can think about how this could translate. Then I think the other question is how you disseminate the information. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of starting to create a, a database of techniques and materials and things. Um, you know, you might think it's easy just to put on a website, but then other people, some people may not have access to the internet. Does it need to be in other types of forms of communication? You talk about maybe a museum show, but that also has sort of a exclusivity to it that maybe not everybody has access to. So, you know, these are obviously all open-ended questions that you're probably wrestling with already, but it was great to see the research. Thank you. Hi, Oti. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, hi. hi. It was really fascinating and wonderful. Um, and I, I know that your focus is the materials and the construction methods. Um, my background is landscape and urbanism. And so I'm also curious about the decisions or like the urban condition um, that, that give rise to when a certain building is constructed and also the site itself. Um, like if, if you've done research on the site um, selection, the considerations of why this particular location, um, and also like its preparations. We, we looked at the foundation. I wonder if there's like, um, I don't know. I mean, it's very dry as you mentioned, but like any sort of drainage um, rerouting or sloping or things of that nature. Um, and then in like the urban kind of condition that gives rise to the structures like, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where to start with with that, but like, yeah, what is kind of the social condition that um, makes the decision to build a structure or build a number of them, that kind of thing. So I know that's sort of beyond the building itself and its materials, but I think it maybe mm -hmm. could be part of the story as well. Um, yeah, thank yes, you. Yes, yeah. Thank you. I, 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 as of now, have just been concentrating on the buildings, but I haven't really gone um, into like the larger context, like the urban context, as you are, you are mentioning. I haven't really considered that. Though I know the building um, materials they used and the form of the building was all dependent on the things that was in their present location. And if there was um, the need for a rise, um, if there was a need to construct anything, like for instance, maybe a man leaving his family and starting his own family, then he would build and then the community would come and assist him in building. And they, um, most of the buildings there are residential. They aren't really into, even though they farm, they store their food in granaries, which are attached to their, their homes. But it looks like, uh, in the larger context, it was mostly a huge, a vast land for farming and then a house close by, or maybe a community where people lived in various compounds and then they have farms on the outskirts dotted, um, on the outskirts of the residential zone, if I should put it that way. But like you are saying, I haven't really considered it at that large context. And this research is still at the beginning stage. So thank you for bringing that up. I would. Um, be sure to do justice to it when I get to that point. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Um... Maybe while you're thinking about it, I just I had one quick question, or well, a couple of questions. Like, what do we know about that building? Like, in terms of what well, it seems very domestic in scale. So I'm assuming maybe it's for a small family. Like, how many people would live there? And then, like, uh, it looked like it was just a room. Like, it didn't have anything else there. So, would how does how does that? How, do you have any sense of how that structure would work? 
with other structures to kind of, um, I would imagine maybe there would be like a central place where food was prepared or um, also I noticed there was like stairs that went up onto the, the roof. And yeah. I was wondering if what that was all about, like if that was something as part of the community. Um, yeah. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit more if you know at least about that. Yeah, um, so for them, they built one structure for one purpose. There wasn't much of a multi-purpose um, space. And with the video we watched, it was for, a, it was a man's house. And I actually, I actually, I honestly don't know if it was for him and his family or for him, just him. But what I do know is um, in, the, in, those, in that area, the men married more than one wife. So usually there'll be like a central point where it is the house of the man. And then you'd have um, quarters of the wives dotted around that central point, which housed each wife and their kids, each wife and their kids. And um, when I was explaining the, the um, flat roof, I mentioned a bit that the, the, they made the roof flat for um, many purposes, but for the one that was for the one that's outstanding would be um, drying of their farm produce because they didn't build for just the humans, they built for their animals and their gods. It isn't very wise to dry your maize or your millet on the ground because the chickens will have easy access to eat them up. So they'll, they'll dry them at the roof, at the flat roof. And then, so those ladders that you saw is the access to the top. And it wasn't just for drying, it was also used for relaxation. If it was a, um, at night when it wasn't so cold, though it's very hot during the day, as night is quite cold. And in the nights um, where the season where it's not too cold, you could actually go and sleep over there and just relax and stargaze. And it was also used as a means of announcements um, in the very olden days when slavery was still ongoing. Should anyone have spotted a slave raider or a, a, a slave trader coming into the community, um, anyone could just stand on the roof and announce to the community that the slave raiders were coming and everybody would um, sort of seek refuge anywhere they could. And it was also a place for um, not, just, not just announcing slave raiders, it's also for weddings and funerals to announce when there's a wedding about to happen or there's a funeral about to happen. And even I hear sometimes during, um, I was told that during funerals and weddings, um, people would stand on the roof and sing and clap, ask the people down there dance to the, the, the music they were singing or they were making. So those were a few um, purposes that the flat roof served, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Oti, that sounds kind of amazing. I, I... I imagine sleeping up there at night and looking at the stars must be pretty cool. Um, yeah. Any, any but, oh, oh, and also, well, it leads me to one other question. Um, what would you call that technology that they used where they pounded the earth into those kind of balls and then stuck them together? That's not really rammed earth, right? That's, that's a different no, process. So, yeah. so is, 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 first of all, my question is two part, I guess. One is what do they call that? And then also, is rammed earth a, a technology that you're interested in? And if so, is it being used in, in parts of Ghana? And, and, and how, would, how do you intend to engage with that technology? Or which technology do you intend to research? Yeah, so um, I actually don't know what it's called. <laughs> I don't know what that um, technology is called. I, I, would, I would cross check, but I know it doesn't really have any, yeah. it just, do it and yes ramp earth is something that i consider because it's so similar to um to the way they built and if you in the earlier slides when i showed the lobby house you can actually see um um should i lay that you could you could see the layers of earth that were molded into place and it's so similar to the ram earth and yes in ghana people are building with ram earth but it's it's <laughs> my my my, um, um, how do I put it? I'm a, I'm a little sad at how Ram Earth is coming into the country. It's coming in as some sort of luxury build and not as, a, as an affordable build or a build for the average Ghanaian. So I'm a bit afraid in the coming years, locals will be afraid to venture into that because of the, 
the thought of it being for the rich because for places that has been used is is all in the elite areas in, in in Ghana or in Accra specifically also in the north there are organizations that are um, putting up structures there that are using um, a combination of round earth compressed earth blocks and um, even still using the local methods, but this time around, assuming it was on the, um, the walls were erected on the foundation, which was made out of boulders and um, um, balls of mud, they will now use concrete. So there's that going on, but it's not wide. At the moment, I know of two constructions in, the, in that area being done by um, um, NGOs outside of Ghana that have partnered with Ghanaians to do these projects. Yeah, but it's something I'm actually looking into. Like I, so from the observation stage, when I come to the adaptation stage, that is where I would really look into these um, already existent modern construction methods and how to match them with what they already know so that it's not too foreign to them and they don't feel like, oh, this is for the rich and so we can't live in these structures because that's the mentality that is there at the moment. They are um, building with concrete because they think it's a, it's a sign of wealth because that is what is being seen in the South. And there's a lot of internal um, rural urban migration from North to the South and the South holds the capital. And so people come from People migrate from the north to the south in search of greener pastures. They come and they see this um, beautiful um, concrete buildings with glazing and they want to go and go back and replicate those there because the community will know that, you know, they didn't travel in, they didn't migrate in vain. And when they came back, they came back with something, you know, significant and then it sort of raises their status in community. So at the moment that's what's uh, happening, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because it seems like in the West, there's this fascination with rammed earth. And it sounds like uh, it's like almost as if people are thinking of rammed earth as like a replacement for concrete. Yeah. And um, I wonder if there's something problematic <laughs> with that. You know, again, it's like, yeah, you know, I'd be really interested in trying to understand who are the power brokers behind that, because I imagine. Rammed earth is more is an expensive process and requires maybe a more mm -hmm. technical process. And like you said, it might end up being again another way of constructing the world in an, that that favors an elite, um, the the elite as opposed to to the average person. So yeah, it's kind of interesting that you bring that up because I I hadn't thought about that, but I have noticed there's a lot of interest in rammed earth. And a lot of publications are focusing on, on, on using rand earth technology, but it's interesting to think about maybe what the limitations of that actually are. Yeah. Um, I also want to thank you uh, for, for, for this presentation. Unfortunately, I missed the, also the first uh, 15 minutes, so I, I, I don't know what the um, the bigger picture, but I uh, enjoyed what, what I saw. It was very interesting. Thanks again. And um, two questions or remarks, maybe. Um, first, uh, you mentioned, um, or you showed also a lot of uh, images and photos from a um, from book by Hannah Schreckenbach. So I was wondering if you, you mentioned her, I think, right? Um, so I'm wondering if you're in contact yeah, with her, or yeah. you've spoken to her. Yeah. I have sent a bunch of emails. I haven't gotten any response. <laughs> ah, you, you haven't gotten any response? No, no none at all. Ah, okay, because um, I, I think I spoke to her last time a month ago or so, or oh, two wow. months maybe. So um, if you want, if this is something that might be interesting, uh, maybe it helps. Um, Definitely. And Winston also knows her, or the two of us who have, uh, have uh, worked with her, so we can... Uh, Try to, to help get uh, into touch with her and contact with her. Um, so that's just yeah, a, a awesome. side, uh, detail. And the other thing is because um, Daniel you asked about the, um, there's a term for this um, or a word for the for the for this technique. And um, I also don't know one, but it made me think of something else. That uh, and in general, still watching the video of, of how um, it's not this it's not this rammed earth technique, but this kind of adding piling up on it made me think of something that. Um, I had forgotten about it completely, but uh, in, in the region of Germany, where I'm from, 
um, there's a technique, it's in German, it's called Wellerbau. Um, and uh, it kind of works similar that you, you, you don't ram the earth, but you um, pile it up, basically, make a, make a, and then at the end, just cut it a bit uh, with a, with a, with a, with a, how do you call it? I don't know. Yeah, you just uh, smoothen it on the sides, basically. But uh, essentially, it's not rammed. It's really just piled up. Um, so I just looked up the translation for this. It's called cop whaling, but I don't, <clears throat> sorry, but I think that's a bit uh, something else because it's more about the, the mixture of materials because it's mixed with straw, of course. But um, still, I found it fascinating that I had forgotten about this, but it is really just a, a regional phenomenon in, in the middle of Germany. But it worked quite similar, although the, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> well, although the, the, the economic, climatic, and, and then social conditions are, of course, very different, but, uh, but still. So I thought maybe this is, uh, I know it's always interesting to see this kind of connections and things and places where you really don't expect it. So thanks uh, again for yeah. Yeah, showing this and including this because it. Yeah, makes uh, a yeah, lot of interesting connections. That would be great, Adil, if you could put uh, OT in touch with, is it it's Anna? Is that her name? Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's exactly yeah, what this whole platform is about, is just trying to connect people to help each other. So that would be like very gratifying if something came out of that introduction. Um, anybody else have anything that they want to add? before we turn off the recording. Well, I just wanna say thank you, OT. That was like just such a great presentation. And um, uh, we definitely need to talk more. And uh, I definitely wanna help uh, as much as I can to get try to get maybe some funding for some of your research. And we can talk about ways to put the research proposals together. And if anybody else has any ideas or just people to put OT in touch with, that would be um really appreciate it but um again kudos to you for doing all this on your own with like very limited budget literally taking pictures out of a bus window you know when you had to um it's really impressive so, and i hope that you get to bring this research um i know that you've been applying to schools in the united states i know maybe you only applied to one school this year and i know that you weren't accepted which i'm sorry for that but i think maybe next year try to apply to uh, more schools and I think, um, sure. you know, if you need recommendations from some of us, people like Living, Livingstone and Adil and myself, Marcus, we're, or Chris, Christiana, we're all people who would be happy to, I'm sure, provide um, recommendations for you or even assistance with any portfolios or putting a writing together. We have people who are very good at editing. So, you know, really make, make full use of our network and we're all behind you. So. Uh, Congratulations and don't hesitate to lean on, on any of us. Okay. So thank you, everybody. If no one has thank anything, you so much. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. So if nobody has anything else to add, I'm just going to say thank you again and to end the recording. I will make this recording available on the Telegram chat. So um, you guys can watch it there. Um, so thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend. And thanks, thanks for joining. I really appreciate the participation too. It's Bye. Great. Take care, Bye, OT. Thank you, OT. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good to see you, Christiana. Thank you, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take this care. Is great. Thank Take you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, OT.